All right, so we are live. Um, good morning or good afternoon or maybe good night, uh, dear colleagues and friends uh, across the world, connecting to our webinar here in our symposium. And I must say that I really am very sorry. I'm apologizing for our friends in Asia because uh, we are um, having this uh, live uh, webinar um, at a time that is not very convenient for them. So I know that there are some uh, friends in Asia who, despite the late hour for them, do connect, and uh, that's fantastic. So we very much appreciate that. But also the reason why we have this late uh, appointment is because now we have the opportunity to make sure that our colleagues in um, Latin America and in North America also can do can join. Um, Right, so uh, I would like to, to briefly introduce uh, our uh, cast here, our speakers. Um, so we have um, um, Dr. Yasir Mohammed, uh, who is uh, currently a member of the transitional government of Sudan, and he's the, the minister of irrigation and water resources. So very welcome and thank you for spending the time with us, uh, Dr. Yasir. Uh, before he was minister, uh, that's about a year ago, he was professor and director general of the Hydraulics Research Center in, uh, in Sudan. And for several years, he was also a professor at uh, the IHE Delft uh, for water resources management. Um, secondly, we have uh, Dr. Charles Verus Marti, uh, and he joins from the other side of the world. He is a uh, Professor of Civil Engineering at the City College of New York, and also director of its Environmental Sciences Initiative. Uh, he has published extensively, uh, we know that, in you know, Nature and Science and uh, really the book, big journals, on uh, global environmental systems. He's a member of uh, man, uh, numerous scientific uh, and, and research councils, and he served as advisor to the Bush and Obama administrations, as well as the UN on global change and sustainability. So he has a really a, a track record and we are very, very grateful that you two uh, are with us here. And we have also uh, Jasper Handelink, uh, our tech host. Uh, Jasper um, will help us uh, through, uh, will help us navigate through this webinar here and navigate the uh, IT issues. So Jasper, may I ask first that you give us a brief uh, technical introduction. Yes, thank you, Guy. So on your right-hand side, you will see our chat feed where you can post your comments and questions. Um, on the top, you see a document, read before webinar, um, where you can find details on how to engage with speakers. Please use the format uh, if you want to ask a question, Q, name of the speaker you direct your question to, and your question. Um, and there is a scroll function to go up and down. Also, afterwards, um, this webinar will be recorded and posted to the platform where you will be able to continue the discussion asynchronously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasper. Um, uh, maybe also good to, to, to mention if, if one of the speakers has a problem with his uh, system uh, or, you know, if on the side of the audience, there is an issue that is important to be reported on the IT side. Uh, use a chat function to alert Jasper if something needs to be done. <clears throat> um, we have two uh, presentations. Uh, the first one is on um, uh, strengthening institutional capacity for climate resilience uh, in the new Sudan, uh, with a focus on Darfur, a very famous place. And uh, so Dr. Yasser, will present that and we will ask him now to give a brief recapitulation of his uh, keynote speech. He, he gave already, uh, he recorded his presentation, the full presentation, which as you know is on the website, sorry, on the on the platform and we are sure that you have already uh, clicked on it and already have uh, watched it, but perhaps good to have now a quick uh, recap. Dr. Yasir. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, hello everyone, and uh, I'm really happy to participate in this webinar. Uh, the original plan that I should travel to Daft, and that would cost me a couple of days, so I was a bit worried and hesitant, and 
but I don't know how to say it, fortunately or unfortunately, now that the, the, the symposium is, is on and it's online. And interesting to see people from all over the world, I see here on the right part of the screen. So it's really a new experience for me, but it also lo looks uh, interesting. Uh, I hope we can have a kind of uh, uh, fruitful discussion and I also learn from you and also maybe you hear some stories from my side. Shall we start with the presentation you have? Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Yasser, so the presentation is on the screen, so please go ahead. Okay, well, I also put it on, on, on my side. Uh, I worked since last uh, September, last year, I work as a Minister of Irrigation and Water Resources of Sudan. And this is part of the transitional government of Sudan after our great revolution in, started December 2018. So I'm now like eight months in office. Before that, I used to work at IHE, so I also enjoyed the uh, uh, and uh, capacity building, uh, maybe very different kind of work, mainly on policy making, but I'm trying to make use of my experience and connections in the last 30, 35 years to, to, to try to solve problems, water problems in Sudan in the coming three, period, uh, three years. Next. Let me start the context with uh, a kind of uh, a kind of extreme case. If we start, it is in Darfur, semi-arid climate, that is the Sahel part of uh, Sudan and Africa. Climate variability is a very uh, important issue. And uh, with climate variability, I mean rainfall variability. Because the rainfall is not big, it's mainly like 200 to 400 millimeter per year. And it falls in a very short season of two to three months. But it's very important for the lives of the people and uh, the ecosystem. And uh, mostly people here are farmers and livestock herders. So rainfall is really, is life for them. Climate variability, but also superimpose on climate change. Because sometimes it's not easy to signal out climate variability signal from the climate change signal. But what is more serious, if this is superimposed by poor water governance, like poor institutions, uh, very vague policies, very vague regulations, very limited uh, capacity of human resources, if these three factors superimposed together, it is very likely, at least in our case, we had this Darfur atrocities. We had huge conflict in Darfur, which has really big humanitarian crisis. Hundreds of thousands of people has been killed. Although originally, many people believe that the conflict started around water between the herders who moves from north to south and the farmers, the residentials, competing around water resources. And that has been exacerbated by climate variability, climate change, but more importantly, by poor water governance. Because we had, during that time, we had a military regime, and which is, I mean, the whole effort is, is to be in poor, not to solve the problem of the people on the ground. When these three factors together, they were the key reason for this uh, human crisis we had in Darfur. Starting from this context, my talk, in fact, you already have it in the, in the platform, how we can address, at least during the transitional period coming three years, and years after, how we can address this issue focusing on capacity development. So we had, as I told you, from December 2018 to September 2000 to April 2019, we had this uh, great revolution, peaceful revolution led by young women and men of Sudan, including 
young men and women from Darfur. And we were able to overthrow the military regime. So people now starting this new regime with a lot of hopes to make change on the ground. And the slogan of this revolution was freedom, peace, and justice. And it can be directly reflected to what we are doing in the transition and government and specifically in the water sector. That is uh, the main mandate of my ministry. So uh, coming back to the theme of this webinar, building the capacity of the water sector in Sudan, giving that context, we believe that it should start with What are the capacity needs? And by that, we mean it should be part of the overall need assessment that considers the whole system, means the water governance, including institutions, human resources, policies, finance. It should not be part of this setup. It should be comprehensive or inclusive, because if you do if you do, if you build the human resources and you have the wrong policies on the ground, then the impact will not be optimal. The same thing, if you have very strong institutions and you don't define the relation between what is, what is the mandate of the institution at the state level or at the community level or at the municipality level and what are the mandate at the central level, the federal level, because this is exactly one of our key problem in the water sector in Sudan. You find very big disconnection between the federal capital in Khartoum and what is happening at the states, 18 states or at the regions. So it should be inclusive, it should be comprehensive to include all components of the water governance. That is specifically defining the capacity needs. Then how best it can be built. And we think it should respond to the actual needs. And in many cases, I have an experience that sometimes the capacity building respond only to who is providing the training. No, we think it should respond to the actual needs on the ground. What are the specific needs? Do we need to build the institutions? Do we need to provide more facilities? Do we need to do training? Do we need to change the policies? This kind. So it should respond to the actual needs on the ground. That's the best way to respond to capacity building needs. Sustainability is crucial, but it's not easy. I, I remember uh, 30 years ago, or maybe more than that, early 90s, we built very sophisticated flood forecasting system of the night to tell the people. Uh, we did it with Delft Hydraulics, by the way, Deltaris. At that time, it's called Delft Hydraulics. It was a state-of-the-art technology uh, recording the rainfall from satellite over Ethiopian highlands. And then using models, we can predict how high the floods will come to Khartoum or how many days. It was very state-of-the-art kind of techniques. We trained, or at that time, the government trained like 10 engineers to come to the Netherlands to know the modeling and uh, to run the system. But one year later, the 10 engineers re moved out from the ministry because they found better position in the private sector in Sudan or out Sudan, outside Sudan. So sustainability of the capacity building effort is, is, is important. That requires time. But it's also important to link the capacity building needs with, uh, as I started my first point, with overall needs assessment. And we should, what could be the role of all the stakeholders, that's government, community, private sector, in, the, in, in this water business. And we believe that each one role is crucial and should be respected. And the roles from all these partners would be, should be complementary. In that way, we can 
we can try to solve the problem, at least in the context of, of, of my country or the context of many parts in Africa, and create impacts on the ground. And uh, I, this is my last slide. And I, I'm, I'm sure uh, that there was longer uh, slides in the platform. Sudan is endowed with huge land and water resources, but faced by natural climate variability, climate change, technical, institutional, and financial challenges. We, we admit that, we know that, but we believe that revitalization of the water sector gives huge opportunity for socioeconomic development for the Sudanese people. It can be the driver for the socioeconomic development. And we believe it is well possible. Thank you very much. This was my quick introduction to my speech or a kind of general overview of my speech during this webinar. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yasser. Um, and let's now move to um, uh, Charles. Uh, who will uh, talk about um, uh, training a next generation of water scientists, engineers, and policy makers, and also focusing on Africa, but still relevant for all countries in the world. Uh, thank you for that uh, wonderful introduction, Yasir, and thank you to the conference organizers once again for inviting me, at least virtually, to, to participate. Uh, I very much have been looking forward to meeting everyone in person, but that... Uh, simply was not not to be. So this is, uh, I think, a, a fairly good facsimile of, of being together. Uh, I did want to amplify uh, a, a couple of points that uh, Yasser has just made. Uh, and I, I wanted to, uh, I guess, address this from the standpoint that I am speaking here to a community of hydrologists and water uh, resource experts. Uh, and the climate change question uh, is indeed a climate question. It's, it's globally distributed as a as a um, a change to the um, to the planetary heat balance and all. But it's really manifested through the water cycle, and I think it's quite important, and particularly important in places uh, like uh, Sudan uh, and uh, sub-Saharan Africa, in particular the Sahelian Belt, that climate variability and climate change is a little bit different, or in many cases, a lot different than hydrologic change. And what I'm talking about is that the variability that we see in the atmosphere, uh, the amount of rainfall that's uh, hitting the ground, uh, the amount of uh, solar radiation that would evaporate water back into the atmosphere. Um, those are certainly variable in the region of the, the globe that, that uh, our colleague has just described. But what happens is that through this transformation through the hydrologic system, all, all, of, all of a sudden we have issues of recharging groundwater. We have issues of horizontally transporting uh, water that's accumulated as excess uh, uh, precipitation uh, into riverways that in these very marginal areas are extremely variable. And in fact, uh, to my measures, are much more variable uh, in terms of, of sustainable and reliable water supplies than we see coming out of the atmosphere. So I just wanted to uh, maybe just warn us that when we're talking about the climate change question, we're talking about water questions in many cases, and we're talking about hydrological regimes that are no longer vertical in their dimensionality, but have these horizontal uh, components and uh, extreme variability in those, those dimensions. And I think uh, that uh, Sudan uh, and its uh, political uh, instability and its, the atrocities and all, it can be drawn to the water question. Uh, I believe it was drawn to the hydrology question as well. So I just wanted to make uh, to make that point. Uh, so let me turn now to uh, to what uh, would be a summary of, of my uh, discussion points. And I, I'd like to start with this diagram here. Um, it comes from a paper that we recently, a, a group of um, my colleagues and I, uh, were solicited uh, by the UN World Bank High Level Panel on Water. I think there are 11, at its peak, there were 11 heads of state who were very concerned about water security issues. 
and they worked uh, through the, both the UN and uh, uh, World Bank auspices uh, to come up with a game plan on water security. And one of the issues that had come to light during the deliberations was how might uh, green infrastructure, that is natural capital, that is ecosystem services, uh, be allied together with green infrastructure to uh, bring about uh, improved uh, advancements in water uh, uh, security. Uh, we published uh, that solicitation, which was essentially delivered as a white paper to the group. We actually published that in the peer-reviewed literature back in 2018. It's this uh, 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 paper, front page is shown here. It's in eco-hydrology and hydrobiology. And so those of you who want to get a little bit more background, I would uh, definitely uh, uh, turn your attention to, uh, to, to looking over that paper, where it really does lay out some of the main principles here. That I would like to, to talk about. And one of the, the things that we did is we uh, produced, uh, I guess what you would term a heuristic model, and these are uh, aspirational, let's, let's just say they're not, um, they're not uh, always uh, realized uh, in, in, the, uh, in nature, in the real world, uh, but they're aspirations. And what we've done here, and Jasper, do I have any control of, of, the, uh, of a cursor or a pointer at all, or no? Uh, no, unfortunately not. So you okay. need to describe it. Okay, let me describe it as best I can. So on the horizontal axis, where you see these balloons, these different colored balloons, the horizontal axis is the level of utilization, uh, capitalizing on green infrastructure uh, and uh, ecosystem services, from low levels on the left to high levels on the right. Gray infrastructure would be uh, levels of insufficient service uh, moving up towards uh, basic and advanced services. And we looked at these uh, little heuristic models uh, between the period 2015 and 2030, so the start and the end of the SDGs. And the whole idea here is that because of investments uh, in uh, the uh, SDG uh, agenda and the infrastructure that would be required in particular for SDG 6, which is on water, uh, all countries should be moving up towards uh, advanced level, okay? But they're doing so in very, very different contexts. And uh, if I could just point your attention to this uh, little balloon that's uh, listed as A1. A1, uh, we had uh, presented as the experience that uh, you would see, for example, uh, in Afghanistan in 2015. Insufficient uh, gray infrastructure, uh, very low utilization of any green infrastructure that was available. And uh, with some luck and some uh, good hard work and some appropriate investments, hopefully by the year 2030, the people uh, in Afghanistan will have at least basic services in terms of drinking water and sanitation and using whatever green infrastructure uh, that they can, uh, they can muster, okay? On the right uh, is B1. B1 is the condition for uh, Uganda, Kampala, Uganda, uh, starting out with relatively insufficient levels of gray infrastructure, but high levels of potential green infrastructure that could be used to bring about this water security. And uh, hopefully uh, the utilization of that green infrastructure and there are large wetlands that are used for uh, cleaning uh, the uh, effluents that are flowing out of the, the city. Uh, with, um, with dutiful um, uh, uh, keeping to the game plan here for the SDGs, we would see hopefully that the green systems would be preserved and the gray infrastructure, the, the basic traditional engineered systems for bringing about clean drinking water and sanitation uh, uh, would move up, uh, up in, in this phase plane plot. Uh, the ideal setting as we have reasoned is to combine green infrastructure and gray infrastructure. And the whole idea here is that from what has been reported in the literature, you would see great cost savings if you are drawing your water resources from ecosystems that are not damaged or degraded or somehow impaired. And because you have vibrant, uh, uh, vital ecosystems, you reduce substantially the amount of gray infrastructure that you would need 
to install and also uh, to operate and maintain. And this could be substantial cost savings in a place like Sudan or many other parts of, of, of Africa, if not other parts of the world. And so again, I, I would we don't have time to go over this whole diagram, but uh, if you can, please check out this uh, reference. And we show several examples from around the world, including uh, the developed part of the world, uh, in fact, New York City in one case. May I have the next slide, please? Okay, uh, the, this looks like a very complicated diagram, and perhaps it is, but it, it, it is really trying to make a very simple point. And uh, what we're doing here is we're trying to articulate the fact that you have assets that you can deploy towards bringing about water security. And so we could take a look at SDG one and two, uh, uh, SDG, sorry, six, target one and target two. 6.1, the drinking water target, 6.2, the sanitation target. But please understand there are other targets within the domain of SDG six. And for water, we have to worry about pollution and we also have to worry about the state of ecosystems, okay? And so what we did is again, a thought experiment here uh, in which we took the concept of a landscape and that box that you see that's enclosed in black, the black box that occupies the left part of the screen, that's a, uh, a, an element of the landscape, okay? And that element of the landscape generates local runoff. It also receives uh, water from upstream. And we can categorize the state of affairs with respect to that water, and we can uh, apply a, uh, a little risk factor. Low risk is light blue, uh, purple uh, color is high risk, okay? Very impaired water systems, okay? And what we can do is we could follow the water that's generated from local runoff on the top left, we add to it upstream inflows, and we mix those together and we have a, a uh, subsidy from the landscape and from the upstream uh, river of uh, total available water that we then present to the ecosystem that are within that domain. And if the ecosystems are in uh, a substantially uh, intact states, they can begin to clean that water and they can reduce the risk to the supply. Why is this important? It's important because the next step as we move towards the bottom half of that box is that the water is, is either going to be passed through to downstream users or it's going to be withdrawn and used by humans. And for 6.1, the drinking water uh, target, we're uh, likely, if it's a city that's sitting upstream, uh, it's going to be withdrawing water from the environment. It's going to be treating, treating that water to some degree and making it available for human populations. And the scenario we're playing with here is using sewers, piped water into households with sewer systems, disposing of the water. Fantastic public health benefit for the people living in the city, benefiting from the clean drinking water, benefiting from the sanitation services, but they create raw effluents that are highly risky. If that risk is attenuated by purposeful wastewater treatment, SDG 6.2, the finishing step of 6.2, you can return the water in potentially an even better uh, condition than when it was withdrawn and used by the city. And then you could move that water to downstream users, okay? And the point here is that depending on what levers that you pull, and the two levers we're pulling are green infrastructure and traditional engineering. Depending on how you balance those, and depending on the state of affairs with respect to populations and water de degraded by upstream land use, et cetera, et cetera, you get very, very different outcomes and you can actually create cross circuits or unintended uh, non-positive uh, consequences within any SDG. And this matrix on the top right captures that. So we have this matrix of high levels of green infrastructure and so low to high. And uh, on the uh, two columns there, we have the traditionally engineered systems with sewage treatment at very low to, to very high levels. 
we have four scenarios basically. And as you might imagine, the worst situation you could find yourself in is having to deal with the water supply flowing through degraded green infrastructure, okay? And not being treated in terms of the effluent that flows back to the, to the rivers and are delivered to users downstream, okay? So that would be scenario C. And in point of fact, scenario C, in terms of these bar charts, shows that about 80% of that water being uh, flow or flowing actually out of this landscape and out of this urban complex to downstream users is highly risky. The flip side, of course, is to have lots of intact green infrastructure and use it uh, sensibly with high levels of support by the traditionally engineered gray systems. That's scenario B. And scenario B, of course, shows the lowest levels of risk. And there are, of course, intermediate uh, conditions uh, for, um, uh, for A and, A and D. The point here being is if you don't pay attention to all of the targets within a, a particular SDG, in this case, SDG 6, you might find that you have made big investments in the wrong kinds of things and you could produce beneficiaries of the upstream, but not downstream. Next slide, please, which is my final slide. So um, one of the, the nice features about this green gray uh, mentality is that gray infrastructure can often be quite expensive, can quite often be over-designed. Uh, it might indebt nations uh, to invest in these, in these systems. Uh, but yet again, it's the tried and true way we've gone about business. So there's a, a real uh, propensity to invest in these systems. But if we can realize that there is this additional resource of natural capital or green infrastructure, if linked together with the gray systems, blended together, we may be able to leapfrog uh, over a, a unitary dependency on the gray systems where we do a better job of, of maintaining the natural capital, maintaining the gray infrastructure, co-designing them, and scaling them appropriately to the places where we need them the most. And as a uh, capacity development and training set of requirements here, uh, in my talk, I wrote up a job description for the 21st century water expert uh, who would be really hopefully thinking in this combined state. And we would be asking of that newly trained person to first of all, execute baseline inventories and execute appropriate monitoring of how is the green, how the green infrastructure is, is uh, faring, how, what its state and functionality is, as well as the gray infrastructure. We discovered, as I explained in my talk, that it's been very difficult to, uh, to gain a, a clear handle on the gray infrastructure. The simple mapping is very difficult, let alone understanding its functionality. So I think the 21st century water expert will be attuned to monitoring the state of affairs with respect to the traditional engineering, as well as the natural capital. We also need to have, along the lines of the, the last slide here, we also need to have experts who can do both biogeophysical and engineering systems models. How does the engineered system interact with the natural system in the most positive way possible? And that gets us into the world of trade-offs. We have to have uh, frameworks for identifying the most optimal combinations of, of systems for different unique settings. And, and you know, Sudan is going to be very different uh, than what you would find in Uganda. It's going to be very different than Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's going to be different than Europe, it's gonna be different than the United States. All of these systems could benefit, we believe, from this, uh, this thinking. And then finally, uh, what's absolutely critical, and, and uh, Yasser's uh, talk uh, very much stressed the human dimensionality of this, including institutional capacity and, and kind of the social setting in which uh, climate change uh, and climate stresses, and I would say water stresses are occurring, okay? And involving regional stakeholders very early on to, first of all, assess 
what are the resources? What is the water resource system looking like in terms of the natural ecosystems as well as the traditionally engineered si systems? Uh, Co-designing improvements to that system have to be done literally at the sub-regional uh, and sub-national scales. And so all of what I might have been talking about as a macro scale set of principles really comes into play as we look at applying these concepts in creative ways at the very local scale. And with that, I would like to turn ourselves over to the question and answer. Uh, thank you very much, um, Charles. That was a very, um, very challenging uh, presentation. And the point you make is, uh, I think, very well taken. That is that we need to be much smarter and much more uh, energetic at um, understanding and making use of the natural capital of the green, um, the green engineering that nature offers us to manage our water systems. I think that's a very important point. Um, I want to do now two things, no, three things. Uh, one thing is I would like to um, uh, put a question to Dr. Yasser, you know, so green, um, so the green uh, infrastructure, is that uh, from your perspective as a, as a minister, you know, as a policymaker, is that something you can work with on the short notice in, in principle, I would say Sudan is a Nile, it has a Darfur, which is fairly dry. So what kind of uh, green infrastructure uh, could potentially be applied there? Is there a scope? Um, secondly, we can uh, launch this, not the first poll. So we are going to ask the audience, so what do they think <clears throat> uh, about the, uh, the opportunity here? Uh, do we already understand enough about uh, nature-based solutions, about green infrastructure? Um, are we ready to apply it? And thirdly, I invite you, the audience to uh, uh, send in the questions. So we have already a couple of questions that have rolled in, uh, addressed to Yasser. And thank you, Jacqueline, for uh, apologizing. It's not so uh, terrible that you, uh, you know, clicked uh, just a little bit too, too early, but that's, all, that's fine. So, um, so if the um, audience has further questions, please uh, come in. And in the meantime, I ask uh, Yasser and Charles to look at the questions and, uh, um, uh, you know, prepare for the answers. Uh, you may first like to address the question that I posed, you know, so what do you think about Sudan uh, and, and, and indeed Africa and the opportunities to do more with green, green infrastructure? Uh, okay, thank you for the questions. And uh, and I, I do agree with Charles is that you cannot split the green infrastructures, green infrastructures, but I would expect always they go together. And as I said in my talk, it should start with the needs, with the actual needs. And the local context also put uh, rightly by Charles. Uh, for example, uh, in, in this Darfur area, they use baobab tree to store water, to harvest water. I mean, that is, you can say, green green uh, infrastructure. Absolutely. And and in some places, you need to to dig groundwater wells to provide water on this in this arid arid lands, or to do water harvesting to make some some water ponds. And maybe you say, okay. Around the water ponds, I should grow trees to reduce evaporation. So, I would the philosophy is fine, it's good, but it should be very much depends on the the needs, the actual needs, and the context. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Jasper. Do you have uh, the uh, the poll that you can uh, show? Poll number one. Okay. Thank you. So it's already um, circulating. Um, I'm wondering if Charles has also a comment on, on what uh, Yasser just mentioned. Um. Yes, uh, yes, certainly uh, we we need to look at these as tandem systems. And uh, there is actually is a question that I think I could answer at the same time I combine it with the answer. Sure. To the question. So Jacqueline Mathura asks, Charles, looking at the ABC scenarios, uh, what does it say? Do do we have case studies of countries or utilities that have successfully combined the gray and green infrastructure 
or link the natural capital with traditional engineering. Uh, so yes, there are several several examples, uh, and that's the good news. Um, the um, uh, there was a, a paper written in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, I, I think it was back in 2016, by a fellow named uh, Robert McDonald. And he led a group that uh, analyzed, I think it was a 325 or 330, uh, perhaps more, uh, uh, water, uh, drinking water uh, systems, urban drinking water systems. And uh, surely enough, uh, whether we know it or not, we... Uh, we actually do rely on green infrastructure as the water resource provision areas that flow into the engineered infrastructure of cities that are then used by urban populations, right? And there are 300 examples of this that he showed. And the good news is that, yes, we are in fact uh, capitalizing on, on, on green infrastructure. We're using it routinely to get water into our cities, right? Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is that in a very, very many of these uh, systems, they discovered that over a hundred year time period, even though these were especially, they were supposed to be especially well protected because they are in fact urban water supplies, they found that there was an incursion of population. They found that there was an incursion of, of grazing land. They found that uh, there was an incursion of crop production. They found uh, runoff coming off of these landscapes was polluted with nitrogen runoff and uh, phosphorus and sediments. And what these debilitations to the green infrastructure had done is it made it more, more and more and more difficult for the gray infrastructure to operate. Hmm. And as a consequence of that, the price tag of the operations and maintenance of the gray infrastructure went up. So yes, in answer to this question, we have to think about these systems together, but just like you would be thinking of maintaining your infrastructure in the first place, your gray infrastructure, you have to have the same kind of mentality that you have to upgrade and protect and keep well functioning the gray infrastructure or else your price tag goes up in terms of operations and maintenance, just like you would see with the traditionally engineered systems. But putting them together and creating a package, we think that we can uh, do a better job, first of all, of reducing the cost of delivering the services, but also at the same time protecting nature, uh, protecting uh, all of the benefits that you would, the co-benefits you would get from those ecosystems in many parts of the world, food supply, uh, a, a more uh, reasonable uh, possibility of flood control, uh, with these intact systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So I would just like to, to maybe kind of combine those two answers and hopefully that did the trick. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to pick a few of the questions that have been rolling in and they uh, are relevant both for Yasir and for Charles. And it is about, okay, how to move forward. So we definitely have to uh, change a paradigm here, right? So it is from... Uh, so so far, we tend to educate our engineers for the and our decision makers for the gray infrastructure. So how to make better use of this combination? Um, so how to move forward on, on on this side? And so there is on one hand the question uh, to Dr. Yasser. So he has said in his speech that capacity development has to be embedded in in the bigger program. So there is it has to also be about institution building about the regulations, the strategy of the country, but also getting the right knowledge in place. On the other hand, the question is um, how to keep the smart people in the organization so that they do not escape to, uh, to, to other countries, you know, in search of uh, fortune. Um, and that also links up then with the question to Charles uh, from um, Thea Bongertman, and it is, uh, how can we get from the current education system to one that delivers the, uh, the, the expert, the water expert of the 21st century? So that's a combination of questions. Um, so perhaps let's first listen to Dr. Yasser. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I will try to, to answer in a quick way so that to cover uh, all questions, if not most of them. 
Uh, most question, if not all of them. Uh, there was a question about uh, uh, capacity development and uh, it takes time. Uh, what actions we are thinking in Sudan, I mean, during this, this new regime? This is a very relevant question, in fact. Uh, it should start as I still emphasize that capacity development approach should, should be comprehensive, should be inclusive, including all components, but it is a kind of dynamic issue. I mean, all this should go, go, should go in parallel, like policy reforms, like building in the institutions, like, like building the capacity of the personnel. All this should go in parallel, and of course, at the same time, you have the crossing, while at the end of the day, you aim at strong institutions, I mean, including everything. For example, one of the uh, immediate needs we found is that uh, we needed to hire engineers of high quality, because we found out that most of the engineers during the last 30 years, there was limited training, limited uh, rules of law. So what we did, we hired like four advisors. Those are Sudanese. They used to work in international organizations, uh, overseas universities. So now these are four of them. In fact, the plan is to hire 10 of them and they work on the, they are in their daily work. They work with the youngest staff of the ministry. In fact, in, in a very effective way of on the job training. Uh, there's a second question on uh, by Arno or what is the role of universities? Of course, it's crucial. Fortunately, we have started a capacity building program, a fast track capacity building program, program with IHE for the Ministry of Water in Sudan. And we wanted to do it differently. So to start, what should be the impact on the ground? So we are making this training coming from IHE addressing the needs. We did very comprehensive program to, to set the needs and, and joining efforts or joining forces with local universities to implement this, this training, even with local staff. Uh, there is a question from Hussam on how, I mean, you built the capacity of the people and when they go back from IG or from Europe, when they go back to Africa, they don't stay on this government low paying government jobs. So they move to better or to green pastures. In fact, this is true, but it is it is also life. And we have to work uh, to, to, to address these problems. So what we did, what we did is that, for example, the last winter season in Jazeera has the highest wheat productivity in history per fadan, per acre. So like, we have like 15 sacks, like uh, maybe uh, on average, like 1.5 ton per hectare, uh, per acre. Yeah, it seems that we have um, a temporary break on the connection with uh, Yasir. Um, okay. Um, we are going to try to uh, reconnect with him. Jasper, perhaps you can send him a, an email to uh, ask him to um, refresh his, uh, his browser. In the meantime, let's shift to Charles. Uh, the same questions, of course, are equally relevant for you. So how do you see the trajectory sure. for moving forward? Uh, OK, well, I, I think you probably have gathered uh, at this point uh, the fact that I come from a much more, let's say, biogeophysical perspective than might uh, Yasir, which I think makes for a perfect complement to, to this discussion. So that's 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 an observation that's positive. Uh, in terms of trajectories, I'd like to then uh, uh, start with what I have uh, seen, and I um, am soon hopefully publishing a paper uh, on this very issue of trajectories. And the trajectories that we see with respect to gray and green infrastructure are quite uh, striking from the standpoint that if you map out the relative change in infrastructure invested currently today versus 30, 40, 50 years from now, if 
we adopt a business as usual mentality, and I don't see any reason we wouldn't unless we struggle against it, there's going to be enormous increases in the deployments of gray infrastructure globally in terms of dams and reservoirs, in terms of uh, sewage systems, uh, treatment plants of one type uh, or another, interbasin transfers, irrigation works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if the past is any uh, key to the future, looking at the future, we're going to see, uh, especially in places like Africa, uh, many fold increases in the level of infrastructure for water security that we see today. So it's, it's an upward, upward trend. Uh, by the same token, and it should come as no surprise based on what I shared about water supply systems, if there's a business as usual uh, modality, the trajectory we see for the future of green infrastructure is that it will continue to be destroyed. And again, as you begin to destroy and degrade these ecosystems, it becomes more and more expensive to invest in the gray infrastructure because it's having to overcome the degradation that you might not have seen if you were sensible and tried to protect those green infrastructures. So what I see as the macro scale trajectory is the growth of the, the engineering and the decline of the green infrastructure, which of course makes life very much more difficult. So I would say that if we're trying to uh, look at the trajectory of expertise needed uh, just for the water sector alone, we need to be uniting the engineers that we're producing. We produce all of these engineering cohorts and we need to have those engineers talking with the ecosystem experts and understand that there's a new kind of eco engineering that we need to develop as a, a paradigm for thinking through these issues. We cannot have people who design dams and reservoirs uh, and sewage treatment plants uh, not understanding that there's a broader set of ecosystem perspectives that we have to take into account. So the trajectory I would like to see in order to change the actual trajectory that I see in nature is for us to increasingly unite the perspectives of traditional engineering and biology. And I, I would, an ecosystem uh, service uh, uh, expertise. I would also go one step further. I've had a very interesting dialogue with um, someone who's uh, in the higher echelons of something called the World Federation of Engineering Organizations. His name is William Kelly. He's a former engineer in the United States. And he's really taken on this notion of sustainable infrastructure. When I talked to him, I was always thinking initially we'd just be talking about gray engineering, traditional engineering. But he's very much into this green-gray blending of systems. And he's taken it upon himself in his retirement to, or semi-retirement, to promote this concept of these blended systems. And he's gone one step further saying that he believes that the 21st century engineers we are producing today are not sufficiently broad in their understanding of all sorts of other things, like public policy, like history, uh, like natural uh, uh, system studies, like economics, like legal systems. And he has argued very strongly in the US system, we're trying to broaden the perspective of our, of our own engineers in the United States. I can see no better place to apply this kind of broad thinking than in many other parts of the world, like in Africa. Thank you, Charles. Maybe now that we have Dr. Yasser back with us, we still have um, six minutes. Uh, Yasser, um, uh, as we were also talking about, you know, how to educate the, the next generation, uh, do you think that in Sudan, um, uh, there is already enough uh, capability in the universities and in vocational training uh, uh, institutes, um, in research centers to uh, be prepared to work with green infrastructure, to value it and to combine it with gray infrastructure for optimum benefit. You think that's already 
present, or you think there should be some, um, you know, some enhancement to be done? No, I, I think uh, uh, as a new idea or new approach, you don't see it uh, like a uh, department in a university or a section at the research center. You don't see this, this kind of, uh, even for myself, I, I had to look into Google in the morning to, to understand what's green <laughs> infrastructure and green infrastructures. But, but the philosophy itself is there, of course, in practice, even in practice, it is there. So the idea is, to me, is, is not very new, but how, how to articulate it in a, in a more structured way. Yes, right. Uh, yeah, so, um, but again, I should say, it should not, should not be kind of uh, top-down kind of approach. It should be bottom-up. What, what are the needs is there? How, how, how to do the best combination between this gray and green, green infrastructures? That should be, that to me should be the key driver on this, on this. But if I, the, I, I'm sorry that the line went off. But if you if you allow me just a few minutes to respond quickly to some of the questions, sure, go ahead. Is that, is that okay? Uh, because some of the relevant question is that uh, addressing my my worries is that, for example, one one question is that how can you how can you keep good staff after they get trained in these uh, ministries? And we say, and it's possible. I mean, it is possible to to keep some of the good staff by giving them opportunities to grow, to move in the system up. I mean, uh, this promotion, uh, like now the, the key modeler doing this Renaissance Dam modeling, the impact of the GERD on Sudan is, is, he came from IG like one or two years ago. So now he's a key part, a key member of the negotiation team with Egypt and Ethiopia. When the young people see that the opportunities is in front of them, they, they, they stay in these poor government jobs. Uh, there is uh, also relevant questions how we, from somewhere, is uh, um, Yes, uh, perhaps we have again lost connection with... Uh, <laughs> Sorry? Sorry. Yeah, come again. You can come again. Hello? Yes, Okay. Can hear you. Uh, well, uh, a, a, a similar question is... Uh, Yes, Many people ahead. graduate from IT when they go back, they don't stay. But I, I would say this. Well, this is, doesn't seem to work very well. Uh, yes, Jasper, we still have a few minutes. Um, can I ask you to post a second poll? The second Sorry, poll yeah. is to ask yeah. our um, audience. Sorry uh, for all this interruption. <laughs> uh, we do Sorry. have uh, Yasser back. Uh, but yes. Yes, Jasper, can you uh, uh, post the second poll? The second poll asks the audience, uh, how can we best build this capacity for nature-based solution for green infrastructure? So this is also a, a quick poll to, to, to pull together some uh, the wisdom of our audience. And um, uh, so it's, it's a very instrumental one, very related to capacity development. Uh, so I see that now we have already 30 seconds of uh, Dr. Yasser back with us. So perhaps, sir, can you try <laughs> to, uh, to 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 come back to your yeah. question? Yeah, one last like, question. I think one last question about how to build the, the capacity of local communities. And I think it is very relevant. We should, it is two-way learning mechanism. We learn from them, from local communities, how best we do it. But we also can share experience from other communities communities to so uh, sorry uh, my apology my apology for these interruptions in fact I'm using internet from my mobile and someone is trying to call and uh, <laughs> so my apology for that. go ahead go ahead so uh, how to build the capacity yeah. how to build the capacity of local communities i see is that it is two way in fact this is about renaissance dam so it's, it's really hot issue nowadays in our region and so 
Dr. Bahman, maybe uh, I would suggest you answer questions in the chat panel because I um, I think we have um, strong. Okay, internet, I will uh, I will write I will write in the chat panel. Perfect, perfect. Sorry, sorry. Perfect. I will write. Thank you so much for. Yes, I will write that. the. Um, okay. Let's see if Charles has a final uh, comment or advice to give to us. Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, I, I guess uh, an observation. So I've been looking over the questions here, and uh, and it's interesting. So uh, the uh, I, I'm, some of the people, of course, are from IHE, but some, of course, outside of IHE. But it seems as though the the audience members uh, understand the the inherent value of combining these systems. Uh, there are going to be different kinds of challenges in different parts of, of the world. But I think that there's an inherent acceptance, at least among the participants, that it's important to preserve the environmental underpinnings that really ultimately allow us to even consider the sustainable development goals. And that word sustainable, that's within those, those three word phrases. Sustainable development goal for 17 different domains. And the word sustainable, means that you have to think in a long uh, period of time, you have to think multi-generationally, and you need to have this paradigm change. And one of the uh, one of the key concepts here is that if you're looking over time horizons, putting a uh, piece of well-designed, let's just say a very well-designed, efficient gray infrastructure in place, uh, virtually instantly, once it's constructed, can bring the the design benefit, the benefits that you've, you've tried to to, uh, to bring about. And, it, and there's no time delay. You basically, you start to use it and it, it's, it's working. The gray infrastructure makes us think about a multi-decadal, if not multi-generational time horizon, that if you really want to design these blended systems, you have both the gray mentality that you build it, you get the benefit quickly. The green mentality requires you to be thinking about environmental stewardship, perhaps rehabilitating landscapes, perhaps replanting forests. Uh, I'm sure that many people who are on the uh, Zoom meeting here know about the Trillion Tree uh, project that's been promoted by the World Economic Forum. You know, in order to do that, you don't simply snap your fingers, you don't pour some concrete, don't connect the pipes, that's gonna take a very, very long time to try to bring about those changes, which have very enormous potential uh, positive uh, elements in terms of the water system, but also some negative ones because they'll be using up valuable water supply. The only point I'm trying to make here is that the time dimensions of gray infrastructure and green infrastructure are very, very different. So as we begin to educate the next generation of our engineers, our scientists, our practitioners, as one person in the chat box said, you know, gray infrastructure is, is a ribbon being cut and the politicians love that. Well, the politicians also should have to realize that these investments are in the long term. They're not uh, to be made within a, any one or two or three year period. They're, they're in there for the decades. So I'd like to just simply end on that note if there are not any other uh, questions that we wish to, to address. Thank you very much, Charles and uh, Yasir. Um, we have to come to a closure now. Uh, we are, have uh, some friends in uh, Indonesia and other places in Asia for whom it is already past midnight. So uh, <laughs> let's uh, come to closure here. Uh, Jasper, two things. Uh, first, maybe you can show the, uh, the poll results. And then secondly, you can tell us here, our speakers and the audience, um, what next. So how the uh, chat questions will be uh, Collected, collected, and uh, be further uh, addressed. Thank you, Guy. So, firstly, the poll results over here, and I will move on now. So, um, and thank you, everyone, for um, any questions that were not answered during the webinar. We will post them on the platform along with the recording of this webinar and we will strive to 
uh, answer all of them shortly. Um, do not forget to um, keep track of the discussions in the post in which the recording will be um, placed online. And um, finally, please um, comment, like, or post content on the platform um, to keep the uh, discussion going and to exchange your ideas. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Dr. Yassir, Charles, you. and uh, our friends in the audience across the world. Thank you so much. And uh, we are going to continue this uh, debate and this struggle. So wash your hands in the meantime and to see you very soon again. Thank you.